Welcome to today's session on Predictably Agile by Carl Scotland. Carl, so happy you could join us here today. A little bit about Carl. He heads the TGS Agile Transformation Services practice in EMEA, passionate about helping businesses become learning organizations. He was awarded the Honorary Brickell Key Community Contribution Award at the 2013 Lean Systems, uh, not, sorry, 2013 Lean Kanban North America Conference, founding member of the Lean Systems Society, Limited with Society as well, a pioneer of using Kanban systems and strategy development for product development. So, Carl, without further ado, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Usha. Uh, let me share my screen. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Uh, it's it's great for me to be back at Agile India again, um, even if uh, I'm not there in person, I've not been able to travel in person. Um, I was just looking back, um, I think it was 2013 I was last at the Agile India conference. So when I when we were able to travel uh, travel internationally, I was just like nine years, seems a, it's been a long time. Um, so hopefully one time I'll get, one day I'll, we'll, we'll be able to travel again and I'll be able to come back and uh, be there in person. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm currently working for Tech Systems Global Services. Um, we are, a, as, as it says in the name, it's, we're, a, we're a global organization. We work with uh, organizations uh, all over the world. Um, I myself, I'm, I'm based in the UK, um, live, in, live down in Brighton on the South Coast. Um, but the great thing of, of working with someone like Tech Systems is uh, I do get to work with people all over the world. Uh, and I've actually um, just finished uh, early this year uh, an engagement where we did have a great team of agile coaches that were based in India. So um, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, so we're going to talk about predictably agile today. Um, so um, I thought just to kick off and get going. Let's do a, a Mentimeter. So I'm going to switch my share over to Mentimeter. And uh, if you, you can either scan on that QR code or go to menti.com and use the code there, 34112028. Um, you should be able to, uh, well, you, you'll probably just see these instructions. So I'll just hold this slide here. Um, for a, for a minute, just to allow people to get into Menti. And I'm going to ask a question. Um, I'll, I'll give you the question now so you can start thinking about it. Um, when I talk about predictably agile, what kind of predictable? What, what does predictable mean to you when you think of the, the phrase predictably agile? I'm going to flip over then. So you should be able to. Um, Enter some text. So just add a bit of text, a uh, few words, really short phrase. What comes to mind when you hear the phrase predictably agile? What kind of predictably? So hopefully we'll start seeing some answers coming in soon. Great, thank you. Meeting goals consistently. I like the word consistent there. Assuming, yeah, interesting. Vision is clear. Deliverables, predict predictable deliverables, yeah. Predict the impediment as well as the goals for the future. Great, yeah, deliver goals of time. Forecasting, yes, interesting. Use the word forecasting. We might come back to that a little bit. No spillovers. Presumably that means uh, delivering everything you said you do and nothing, nothing coming in late. Quality, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, keep keep on putting those in. I'm, I'm going to switch back to the slides now, but I'm always interested to to find out what other people think because I think when we talk about predictability, um, it's important first to kind of understand what do we mean by predictability because there's lots of different ways of thinking about it. So this is the way I think about it. And, and I, I went and pulled out a, um, a definition from the Merriam Webster Dictionary. And I think what's interesting here is, is the two definitions it gives. The first one, um, the, the bit that jumps out to me in terms of the, the capability of being predicted, um, able to be known, seen, or declared in advance, 
Um, and I find a lot of a lot of organizations when they want to be more predictable, it's because they want to be able to declare in advance what they're going to get and when they're going to get it. Um, that to me is, is the most common interpretation of the way uh, about predictability. So that idea of, of, of forecasting, do, can we forecast and use the forecast to declare in advance? Um, you know, somebody said no spillovers. So we know we declare in advance what we're going to get and, and nothing spills over beyond that. But the other definition is the one that I find more interesting around behavior, behaving in a way that is expected. Um, and the things I'm going to talk about when I talk about predictably agile are more about um, predictability of the system in the terms of the system, um, where the system is our, our development system or our organization as a system. Does our system behave in a way that is expected and therefore we can kind of have a have an understanding about what we're going to get out of it. So for me, it's more useful to think of predictability of agile as by is using agile techniques to help our organization behave in a way that is expected, expected. Less useful to think about agile in terms of helping us declare in, in advance what we're going to get. Because that kind of starts getting us back maybe into waterfall because we start trying to figure things out in advance and doing lots of analysis and lots of design in order to do that. So Agile shifts us, I think, more towards definition of two here and trying to move us away from definition one. But, but why, why would I, you know, why, why be interested in predictability in the first place anyway? Um, that the reason... I, I kind of started digging into this and exploring it as it's because when I start working with organizations, really, um, they want to go through an agile transformation because they want to have more business success. They're, they're, they're failing to deliver or they're delivering poor quality or some of these things you see on this slide um, are all elements of, of that they want to improve in order to deliver business success. So we can kind of talk about these six um and five of these six i've always had a good answer so if i go into an organization and I, I kind of talk about these business impacts these impacts we want to have on the business in terms of helping the business be more successful then for something like responsiveness and i define responsiveness as um can the work be delivered quickly then we can look at something like uh, lead time. We can measure lead time as a responsiveness, nice, easy measure. Sustainability, can we can work be delivered in the long term? Um, I can measure things like employee, employee, employee engagement, you know, the sort of HR measures we get, um, employee surveys, that gives us a measure of sustainability. Or maybe we can look at some um, kind of technical measures around um, the quality of the code base. Um, and use some some of those to look at is the code base is sustainable do we have a good architecture and a good design value we can kind of get into well what's the what's the what's the business doing you know what you know how do we define value for the business and and hopefully a business has some way of, of thinking about value whether it's number of sales number of customers uh, or some kind of market segmentation but again we can usually kind of figure out how to put a number on value quality you know, we, we can measure escape defects um, or customer support calls or something like that. Productivity, um, you know, how much work are we delivering? Can we deliver work in quantity? Um, is, is typically throughput. Um, so either the number of features we're delivering, the number of stories we're delivering, or the number of releases we're making or how often we're able to make releases. Um, and then I get to predictability. And I've always struggled to be able to, well, actually, how do we measure that? Why do you put a, a, a number on whether you're able to deliver work consistently and reliably. Um, and it's kind of interesting somebody used the word consistently in the, in the Mentimeter poll, because that's to me what it is. Um, can we deliver consistently and reliably? How do you measure that? Um, and I never had a good answer. So what, the things I'm going to talk about are um, the results of my explorations and, and experiments in that area. Um, to, to maybe give you some ideas around how you might be think about predictability and measure predictability um a lot of this is is a hypothesis um so uh, some of these ideas um some of these ideas i have tried out and used um and, and i kind of talk a little bit about the results there um some of these ideas are still sort of early days that you know i want to dig into a little bit more i want to try and validate my hypothesis hypothesis so my hope is what you take away from this is some ideas um that maybe you can go off and, and try some of these out things out for yourself 
and uh, take my hypothesis and test your hypothesis and maybe even let me know what you learn and what you discover. Um, my, my goal here, the more people that are playing around with this and doing this and trying out trying out different ideas, the, the more data, the more feedback, the more results we'll get and kind of see, um, am I onto something here? Um, does this make sense? Or actually, uh, am, I, am I gone down a, a rabbit hole and I should give up? So let's talk about some ideas then. Uh, and, and before maybe we get into um, some good ideas um, and, and thoughts to, to measure uh, predictability, I want to just talk about some um, or you know, one primary way of doing it, which is the idea of the say do metric, because this is the this is the measure that I see most common when when we, I talk about predictability, um, and I, I don't love it to be honest. So I thought I just should at least uh, explain why. Um, and there's two main types I see. One is the idea of, of velocity predictability. So do teams deliver the number of stories or the number of story points they say they were going to in a sprint? Um, you could argue, you know, that that could be a measure of predictability. Can they predict what they can deliver in a sprint? So it's useful to agree, but I don't think it's really predictability. Um, or if it's predictability, it's more about what you're what you're measuring is the idea of that. That going back to the the two definitions in the dictionary, can a team declare in advance what they're going to do within a two week period? Um, now a lot of teams they can't. A lot of teams, you know plan way too much into sprint um so so it's you know i'm not saying it's this has no value at all um but i think it's a very limited value you, you're kind of helping a team with a, with their planning um but i don't think it gives you any certainly long term predictability any predictability is over that that two week window so it's very short term but the main thing i find with this is it's it's not really react um actionable and it sometimes kind of just leads into to reactive behavior. So um, the, the screenshot here, and this is um, this is a screenshot from um, Microsoft uh, DevOps Azure. Um, I just took it from their help page as a, as a kind of interesting example. Um, what I do like about this is it, it's, it's, it, this is working on account of work items rather than a velocity. So at least we're not measuring predictability in terms of a, of a made up number, um, but you can see you know, let's take this 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 sprint here. Um, we planned, you know, 85. We completed slightly more. There are a few finished late. Great. So what have we done the next sprint? We've said, well, maybe we can deliver even more. So we've planned even more, but now we've delivered a little bit less. So the next sprint, we we plan a little bit less and deliver less again. Plan with the same, don't deliver less. So it um, there's there's always going to be some variation in there. I think, you know, with this, you can end up, you know, maybe overreacting to what you've done in the past um, and, and it actually potentially you're, you're kind of tanked, um, tinkering and tampering with the system almost um, rather than kind of thinking actually long term, what does the business need and what's that long term predictability? So useful in some situations, but to me, I don't think it's a, you know, a great measure of predictability. Um, the other one that's common at the moment is is the, the idea from safe scaled agile framework um, on what they call program predictability. Um, so here, um, and I kind of, for those of you not familiar with the safe, I'll, I'll describe how it works. At the end of a PI, PI is a program increment, which is typically a, a number of sprints, um, typically a, you know around around about three months, two or three months worth of sprints. Um, you say what your objectives are to that sprint. So the plus point here and the, the thing I like about it is it's more objective based rather than just did we deliver stories. So it's getting more towards the value that we're delivering. You put a number on that value. So, uh, and, but we're kind of, it's a fairly arbitrary scale of one to 10. So it's a bit of a made up number for value. And then at the end, you track end of the PR, you track what you actually delivered in terms of that objective. So we can see this top objective here. We said it's had a business value of seven, and we think we've actually delivered seven. Where's the fourth one down? Um, we thought it had a business value of 10, and we think we've only delivered a five. You can then calculate this, this percentage. So what percentage of the actual, of the planned objectives did you actually deliver and chart that over the PIs? And the idea is that you're probably not going to be delivering 100%, but you should be delivering about 80%. You can 
track it by individual teams and then look at the overall. Um, again, it's it's kind of made up numbers again, um, which which I don't like. And I think all you're doing is is measuring how well you are at planning what you're going to do within the PI. Um, and again, a lot of organisations there's 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 value in doing that because they they clearly have no idea about how much to plan and they they overcommit and they overplan. But I'm not entirely sure it really gives the business any long term predictability. Um, it may be a step towards it. Um, so wouldn't say don't do this; it's bad. But to me. It, this, this is another example of this idea of say do not really what I think of predictability um, and I, I, I kind of like this cartoon um, as a way of summing this up quite often we're just making up numbers to try and prove a point um, but they're not really telling us anything meaningful and they're not telling us anything actionable um, it's just you know hey it looks like we're saying what we said we were going to do using this set of numbers that we've made up um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan, as you've probably picked up by now. OK, so if I'm not a fan of that, um, what else What else can we use? So I'm going to introduce the idea of lead time variation, because um, this was this is where I started. And I think there's some some value in this. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about lead time variation and, and introduce how we might be able to use the idea of lead time and variation in lead time um, to give us a better feel for, for how predictable we are. And this is getting into and starting pulling some ideas for Deming. So by measuring lead time and the variation of lead time, we're looking at the process as a whole rather than just our, you know, our ability to plan. So um, this quote here, a process that is not in statistical control has not a definable capability. So what's the capability of the system? Um, and then if we if we can, have, can say that that capability is in control, then we can say the performance of the system is predictable. And this is moving into the idea of, of more probabilistic thinking and probabilistic forecasting and less deterministic planning. So those say do measures to me are more are more deterministic. They were just trying to what do we plan? Did we do that versus what's the probability of us delivering a bunch of things by a certain date um, and the risks around that? So much more kind of system thinking based. So here's my hypothesis, and I'll, this is a this is a um, a lead time or a cycle time, and I'm, you know I personally I use the, the, those terms fairly interchangeably. Um, but what this shows us um, the horizontal axis we have time, and you can see uh, dates along there. Um, on the vertical axis we have the cycle time or the lead time, so that's the number of days it takes to complete something. Each dot represents a piece of work. And what we can see where the dot is horizontally tells us the date that piece of work was completed when it was moved to done and how high up that dot is tells us how long it took to complete the work, the elapsed time from starting the piece of work to finishing it. And by looking at a, a, range, a time range and all the pieces of work over that time range, we see this the behavior of the system. Um, and I've got two you know, almost kind of split the data set in two halves here. On this left hand side, you can see there's a there's a wider variability. So when I'm talking about lead time variation, there's a wider variation or a wider variability of lead time cycle times for the completed work. And then on the right hand side, you can see it's a much narrower. Um, there are fewer items that had a longer cycle time. Sorry. Click the wrong button. So this was my hypothesis that this, the data on the left or using the data on the left, the system on the left is less predictable than the data on the right, which is more predictable. And the reason for that is because there's less variation in there. So that's the basic hypothesis. The, the less variation you have within your system using lead time to measure it, the more predictable you are. Now, actually, Deming would say, and if I, I'm going to jump back to the Deming quote, Deming would say that a system either is predictable or it's not predictable. Um, I think he'd say that. He's not around to, to tell us anymore. But that I think that's my understanding of his work and chatting with people like um, Dan Vacanti, um, who, who knows a lot more about this than I do. That's his view as well. 
Um, and the idea of being more, becoming more predictable doesn't make sense in the way Deming describes it. And I, I kind of struggle with this because um, who am I to argue with Deming? <laughs> he clearly is much cleverer and brighter and knows much more about this to me. But I have this hunch. And, and the conclusion I came, came to is that while both of these actually are equally predictable, what we mean by less predictable here is this predictability is less useful. And this predictability on the right is more useful. And, and when we talk about helping organizations to be more predictable, what we're really saying is we want the data to be more useful in helping an organization make predictions and, and, and do their planning. So I'll dig into that a little bit more. What, what do I mean by more useful and less useful? So the other thing we can do with this, this chart here, this cycle time chart, um, is look at percentiles. Um, and this, this screenshot here is from a tool called Actionable Agile. Um, and I'm just using a, you know, a sample data set that they have in their, in their demo version. Um, but it's a really nice tool for, for kind of visualizing this data and starting to, to, to pull some of this in, information out. So this shows us that 85% of the work, which is 85% of the dots, are below this line, which means that there's an 85% chance of work being completed in 16 days or less. And that's based on having this idea of a stable system. In the past, this data set has delivered 85% of, of work in 16 day, days or less. Therefore, assuming the system behavior stays the same and the mix of work stays the same, there's going to be an 85% chance in the future. The other thing we can take from this is that there's a 20% chance of work being completed in two days or less. So there's a very small chance, you know, a fifth of the work gets completed in two days or less. So we've got that 85% chance and the 25%, 20% chance. Um, and I've, I've, I've picked, so 85% is a fairly standard number. I've picked 20% just because that's that was the easiest thing with the data. What I'm really trying to get at is there's, there's now a gap between the 20% and the 85%, which is 65%. So there's a 65% chance of work being completed between two and 16 days. So when we go to a business and they say, when's work gonna be done? We can say 85% chance, most likely it can get done in 16 days, but you know what? We might deliver it in two days. To me, yes, that's predictable, but is that useful? Because that 16 days could be 160 days or 16 weeks, it could be a really, really long time. And if the business wants to plan, okay, knowing that you might do something in 16, 16 days is, is great, but what happens if it turns up in two days? You've kind of wasted those 16 days, haven't you? So to me, that's that's not so useful. If that gap of 16 days is, is a much bigger gap, yes, it's predictable, but it's not so useful. Whereas, um, if we reduce that gap, maybe it's more useful. So what I did was I took the data set um, and basically reduced the cycle time of every single, the lead time cycle time of every single work item by a half, plugged it back in. And so now we can see there's an 85% chance of work being completed in eight, eight days or less, 20% uh, chance of work being completed in one day or less, which means that 60 percent gap is now eight days. Equally predictable, but more useful because now there's that narrower window of when the work might be completed and therefore the business can plan around that much better. So that was my hypothesis, that narrowing this variation gives us a, a better system, is, is more useful predictably. Can we measure that? Um, now, obviously the, the simpler way is just kind of go 16 days down to eight days, that's numbers come down. Um, uh, that, that was That's the obvious answer. I, I tried and I thought there's got to be a clever, more statistical way of doing this. Um, so I tried a couple of ways. One is the notion of cycle time inequality. Um, so I kind of got this from the idea of income, income inequality, where they compare um, the P90 and the P10. So that's the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile um, for income. Um, so. 90% of income is this, or 90% of the population has this income, 10% of the population has this income. Um, if that gap is narrower, uh, that's then, then um, there is more equality for income. So we could do that for cycle time, just to divide the two. So in my data set one, 
my P85 was 16, my P20 was two. So I can say my cycle time inequality is eight. Calculated the same for data set two. Um, and this is kind of surprised me, but shouldn't have done in hindsight. My P85 is eight, my P20 is one. My cycle time inequality is exactly the same. So um, this was a kind of a big, uh, you know, my hypothesis has failed. Cycle time inequality may be not a good measure. Um, I, I still think the, the the variability is something interesting, but cycle time inequality, not a good way of measuring it. Hypothesis two, maybe then, is look at the, the coefficient of variation. So um, that's the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. Um, don't too worry about all the kind of the detail maths in here. I probably should have warned people at the, the start of the talk that I'm kind of getting into a bit of maths and statistics. Um, I'm not a mathematician myself. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, but we're looking at the ratio here. You can go online, figure out a standard deviation mean. Trust trust me on these numbers, I'll have double checked them, but um, in that data set one, standard deviation 7.33, mean 9.37. So the cycle times coefficient of variation is 0 0.78. What if we do the same for data set two? Um, you end up with a cycle time coefficient of variation of 0 0.76. Not, it's basically the same. Um, I think the difference is just to do with the way some of the things got rounded when I when I halved the cycle times. But again, uh, okay, it turns out cycle time coefficient of variation didn't work. So I'm kind of a bit stuck now because I've still got this hunch. My I still have kind of clinging on to this hypothesis, but I've not found a good way of measuring it. So that led me to the idea of, well, OK, if we can't measure it. Um, so, well, two things. One is why is why 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 have those numbers turned out to be the same, even though my hunch is correct? My I still have this hypothesis. Um, and what I came to the idea is what I really want to do is is reduce the upper items, but not necessarily the, the items that have a long cycle time, but not necessarily reduce the items that have a short cycle time so what can we do to um, tell us when things are taking a long time and worry about those things rather than worry about the things that are already flowing through the system quickly so that brought me to the idea of leading indicators so the the, the idea of a leading indicator and a lagging indicator the lag measure is the trailing measure um, so that's that's our ultimate goal so the lag measure might be something around actual predictability that might be um, measuring that variability. Uh, the lead measure are the ones that actually impact on the lag measure. So the lead measures give us an indication of things that we can measure that we think will predict that we achieve the goal and things that we can influence. So uh, these definitions come from a book for Dis disciplines of execution um, that I really like. And it kind of takes that idea of the lag measure being the uh, overall goal, but you can't always influence those the lead measures are things that you can influence and you think are worthwhile working on. So what would the lead measures be if we wanted to measure and improve predictability? So we go back to our, our cycle time chart. As I said, what we wanna do is make these items, these items that have a long cycle time shorter, we're not necessarily worrying about making these longer or even making these any shorter because we're kind of quite happy to get something in two days. So the focus is on understanding the things that are taking a long time and working on those. And maybe if we can do those, then that brings down the variability, but does it, and does it in a way that, that's more meaningful. So that means we need to pay attention to aging WIP. So this is another chart from um, Action Agile. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of just step through this to explain how this works. Um, and this is using the same data set. So we can see that when something's done, we know that already know that 85% work is done within 16 days. What we can do is take that and step back through the process and work out that actually 85% of the work is in testing in 14 days, 85% of the work gets into dev done in 13 days, 85% of the work gets into dev active in 10 days, um, 85 percent of the work gets into analysis done in five days so we can see not just the percentage of the work that gets to the end of the system but the percentage of the work and how long it takes to go through the various stages in our workflow um, and this is a you know a, a made-up workflow the actual workflow doesn't make any difference and then we can look at the actual work in progress 
and compare it to the historical aging of work. So how has work aged historically? What's the current work? So we've got three items. So this little three on this dot here um, means there's actually three, that, that, that dot, single dot is representing three pieces of work. So these items already have a more than 85% chance of taking longer than 16 days because they're, they're already slower than the most of the work that has typically flowed through the system at, at the typical pace. So this gives us an early indication that if we want to start bringing down our lead times, these three are already going to have a long lead time. So we should pay attention to these three. So looking at aging WIP and starting to measure the, the age of WIP and looking at reducing the age of WIP gives us a way um, of maybe a leading measure towards predictability. So um, we can look at things like, again, another screenshot from Axiom Lagile. What's the WIP age today? This is and this is looking at average whip age compared to last week, compared to last month. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of I'd love Action Agile to kind of just give us a better chart to visualize this. Um, we can see here that um, last week our average whip age was lower, and before it's even lower. So I think we can say that here with this data set, our system is becoming less predictable and not more predictable. Um, so whip age. Looking at whip age, um, I was chatting with with Dan Vikandi and, and his uh, critique saying, you know, what would it look like if you measured total whip age? So you took all the dots of all this work in process and just aggregated together and used that as a single metric where you would want your total whip age to be coming down over time. Might be another way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it um, then is looking at blockers. So what are the things that cause a piece of work to age, to stay in progress for a long time. Typically, it's because things get blocked um, and maybe the, there are dependencies which cause work to get blocked. Um, so this is um, from a tool by Troy McGuinness um, that, that is kind of taking this notion of actually may, maybe if we start tracking blockers and, and managing and, and doing some analysis on our blockers better, then we can start reducing those blockers and therefore we start reducing the age of work in progress, work flows to the system more quickly, the system becomes more predictable or the predictably the system becomes more useful. So you've got a couple of, couple of screenshots here, um, just looking at the total number of blockers, um, but it's color coded by how long that those pieces of work have been blocked by. So here you can see there's you know, about 25 pieces of work that have been blocked for more than 30 days we want that to be coming down and we can see this here trending over time where you know down here we've, we've now got um less than 10 pieces of work that have been blocked for over 30 days and you can see the number of pieces of work with blockers that are being resolved is going up so this gives us an, a kind of indication that we're managing our blockers um and then blocker flow this is the kind of the net flow of are we are we creating more blockers than we're resolving so it's basically number of blockers raised minus the number of blockers resolved gives you kind of the net flow um, and ideally um, you want to get to a point where this you know, is hovering around zero probably um, maybe you know if you've got a lot of blockers then you want to be resolving more of them but once you kind of get into that steady state you know blockers should be coming and going fairly smoothly so measuring blockers um, is another way of looking at how do we reduce those long cycle time pieces of work in progress so we can start narrowing the variation of our lead time, our cycle time, and therefore that makes the predictability of our system more useful and we can start doing really good forecasting with that. So this is my, my kind of current hypothesis um, that I'm currently working with and testing. So I believe that measuring blockers will result in less aged work in progress which result in fewer long lead time work items, which will make the system more consistent. Um, and by consistent, I'm kind of saying that that, that, that variation um, is, the variation is narrower and that will make the predictability of the system more useful. Um, and we'll have confidence in that, the hypothesis when we start seeing stakeholders place more trust in the plans and forecasts. It's not that, going back to our definition, it's not that, 
they know exactly what they're going to get. It's not that we can declare in advance, but we have more confidence in the plans and forecasts. We kind of can trust them more because we have a better understanding of the behavior of the system. Um, and therefore, we have a more useful data um, to make those plans and forecasts. So that's kind of where I am. So I've just kind of done a kind of fairly quick go through. I'm kind of interested in, in people's reactions to that. So I'm going to go back to another Mentimeter poll. So let's kind of go back to this one here and just go on to the next one. So if you go back into the Mentimeter, same one. Um, the codes at the top, if you kind of close the window, go back to 34112028. How do you feel about that? Those ideas that uh, I've just talked about, because some people kind of the idea of predictability makes them nervous. So I'm kind of curious. Um, do people still think it's a terrible idea and we, we shouldn't worry about predictability? Um, are people curious about it, um, curious to learn more about it, or do people kind of think, you know, they really want to go out and, and try this? So. Um, I'll just let it look like we had about nine people respond last time. So I'll just give a bit of time to people result to to, um, to submit their answers. And then I'll show the results. We'll see what people feel about this. Carl, speaking of curiosity, yep. there are two questions from people. Um, when do you want okay. to take those? So uh, let me just kind of finish this poll and then and then I think I've done. So, yeah, we should have five or six. Yeah, five, five or so minutes to, to answer some questions at the end. Sure. So 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 let me let me do this. So. Um, oh, great. So nobody thinks it's a terrible idea. That's always reassuring. Um, yeah, those people that are curious to learn more. Um, so, you know, ask, ask some questions now at the end or, or come to the, the hangout that I'll be going to straight after that. Um, and yeah, I'd love it if people were, were trying out some of these ideas, testing the hypothesis, um, and, and let's let's share what we learn. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, just quickly go back to the slides then. Um, I think that was, yeah, so I, I guess um, there's, there's something I'm kind of always nervous, and this is like this idea that people worry about predictability is they, there's the worry that sometimes we would you know we're trying to be too precise um and we're not kind of allowing for deviation so um i just want to kind of emphasize that that's not that's not what i'm talking about when i'm talking about predictability it's not that idea about being able to declare in advance because there's no deviation there's no variety there's no you know variation in value we do have that and that's why I kind of shift towards more that behavior based definition of predictability. So a couple of quotes, which I kind of think are interesting and, and amusing. The one is the, uh, the, the Frank Zappa quote without deviation. Um, I, can't, I can't see the full quote because I've got the, uh, the Zoom power bars in the middle. But, you know, progress isn't possible without deviation. Um, and then the, the one that um, always kind of comes around every Christmas deviation from the poem will be punished unless it's exploitable. Um, so Rudolph for the red nose reindeer um, deviation from the norm, but um, actually a lot of value in there. So it was exploited. So we need deviation because we don't make progress. That's and that's a lot where the value is. But we can still be predictable if we understand the nature of that deviation. We just kind of manage it and make sure that it, it doesn't get out of control. Great. So thank you. So um, I think, uh, as Usha said, if there's some questions in there, let's let's take those questions and I'll. Uh, um, I shall share the slides later. Um, I think there's a way of sharing them within the conference system. I'll, I'll, I'll try and figure that one out. Um, I'll probably put them on Twitter as well. Um, so let's stop that. Okay. And uh, yeah, let's let's take some questions. The first one is from Joel Rosario. He says, or he asks, I love the second definition of predictability. However, how does this relate to story points or t-shirt sizing in which historical measurements of the team's execution is used to predict what will fit in the next print? Yeah, so um, I, I, I hopefully I maybe answered that when I started talking about the say-do measures. Um, but yeah, that's why I, um, I think using story points. So my preference is always to, um, you know, just do story counting. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of estimation. Um, so yeah, great. So so Joel just kind of put a comment that we've answered it. So yeah, I just kind of just to summarize. Yeah, that idea of 
um, story using story points gives you an idea of how how you good are at planning in the short term, um, not necessarily useful for long term predictability. Thanks, Carl. Okay. The second question is from Gayatri Ishwaran. Uh, she asks, can you help us with the tool used to achieve the reports shown in the slides? Yeah, let me. Um, uh, let me see, can I type? Let me. It, I'll, I'll type the answer into the. Um, sure. Sorry. Into, into, into the, the Zoom answer. Um, so it's it's a tool called Actionable Agile. So if you Google for Actionable Agile, um, then um, that that's what I was showing. Um, there's there's I think I put a link to it in the slides as well. Let me uh, let me just go and double check whether I did that or not. Yeah, so so it's actionableagile.com. And actually, um, the other thing I can do, maybe I'll just put this in the chat. Um, there's a there's a U, URL. Uh, so let me. You can put it from the chat otherwise. Yeah. So so there's a URL, and this is on one of the slides um, to a blog post. So one, it'll take you to the Action Agile website, so you can find out more about the tool. Um, but they they have a blog, so which talks a little bit about predictability as well. Um, but it is kind of where I got that idea of, of the screenshot from as well. Um, so hopefully that answers the question on on the tool itself. There's um, it's it, there's a number of variations, but one of the things it does nicely, uh, and that kind of so I mentioned a, um, a a client we were working with recently um, with with some coaches in India. We used Actionable Agile, and they have a Jira plugin. So if you're using Jira, you can get a Jira plugin. Um, obviously it's it's not free, um, but then basically those reports get generated directly from your Jira configuration. So um, it's it's pretty powerful. Okay, were there any other questions in the chat generally? None so Let's far. If just... anyone has any, please put them okay. out in the chat. I had one uh, call. Mm -hmm. uh, predictable and uh, the uh, thing about blockers. So I was wondering, is there is it something about uh, trying to predict which of the work items might run into blockers? Um, not necessarily, but I think one of the one of the things you can sometimes ask in terms of a, a definition ready. I think I think teams often start a piece of work knowing that it's going to get blocked. So it's not about predicting that it's going to go wrong, but sometimes teams know that we have a dependency here. That dependency is not resolved, but they start the work anyway. So there's sometimes the idea of don't don't start a piece of work unless you have confidence that you can finish it without it being blocked. Now that's that's not a guarantee, and sometimes work gets blocked for 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 reasons that are, that are out of our control. Um, so there's kind of the anticipation of blockers and not starting work. But um, I think I think the way I was describing blockers is just as well, that's one way of of, of reducing the number of work items getting blocked, because if you start a piece of work, now it's going to get blocked. You're 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 almost kind of asking for it to have a long lead time. Yeah. OK. Thanks. Yep. Uh, and and thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Carl, thanks so much for uh, the session. Uh, new insights and uh, I'm sure we got uh, a lot of information by joining the session. <laughs>